if you could please introduce yourself. Oh, yes, sure. Hi, <laughs> I'm Sarah Cody. I'm the Historic Preservation Chief for Miami-Dade County. Thank you. Archaeologists have identified over 16,000 cultural resources in the state of Florida at risk due to the effects of climate change. In Miami, a mere six feet above sea level on average, a natural phenomenon known as the King Tides is causing historic preservationists to rapidly develop solutions for the mitigation of sea level rise and storm surge. The scientific name for a King Tide is a perigean spring tide, and it's essentially when the orbits and alignments of the sun, the moon, and the earth all coincide. And King tides are the highest predicted ocean tides that take place in a calendar year. Um, they're exceptionally high tides. They cause local flooding, mostly along low-lying coastal areas. And because the average daily water levels continue to rise as the oceans rise, high tides can reach further and extend higher than ever before. And sea level rise induced by climate change is expected to lead to more frequent and higher king tides over time. King tides are part of larger climate change, right? The tides are getting um, bigger um, and stronger and more frequent uh, during this part of the year. Um, something we also saw just this week, so I'm actually recording this after um, the devastation of Hurricane uh, Ian to Southwest Florida. Um, and here in Southeast Florida and in the Miami area, what we're seeing is that the king tides are actually supercharged by the storm. So we're seeing increased um, water levels because of the cumulative impact of both uh, Hurricane Ian and of the king tides. And obviously with climate change, as we all know, hurricanes will get bigger, stronger, uh, and potentially more destructive. The king tides they make visible sea level rise encroaching on these historic and prehistoric sites. Without the king tides, the visualization of the risk would not be as possible. Um, it makes everything more of an emergency. It's more pressing. Um, and it helps other people to understand that sea level rise is happening now and it's not happening in the future. Are the king tides part of any larger environmental changes within the climate crisis? And if they are, how so? Yes. So as we all know, human activities are the main driver for climate change. And in essence, what we're seeing with king tides is exactly what climate change has done and will continue to do, increase the sea and groundwater levels. So with that comes increased storm surges, inundation of lower lying wetlands, eroding shorelines, and saltwater intrusion into estuaries and aquifers. The king tides in Florida in particular create massive issues when it comes to red tide and uh, dangerous toxic algal blooms that spread from one coast to the other across these inlets from um, Lake Okeechobee. Uh, so they have, they have created wider environmental problems that are disconnected. So in one way, the toxic algal blooms and eutrophication that we have from sugarcane uh, runoff from pesticides shouldn't be related to climate change, but the king tides um, are affecting this hugely in Florida. As a coastal community, Miami and South Florida in general have always been vulnerable to flooding but we've become more vulnerable to the effects of climate change and sea level rise. And climate change and higher king tides present a unique challenge to our cultural resources. And that's why the Miami-Dade County Office of Historic Preservation has performed a vulnerability assessment to identify which of our historic resources are the most at risk for flooding. And we're currently conducting a vulnerability assessment to do the same for our archeological and paleontology sites. One of my favorite sites to visit and work on in Miami-Dade is the Bill Baggs Cape Florida State Park. So this park is famous for its lighthouse. Uh, people love lighthouses, right? It has the beautiful day mark, which is just um, the white paint. Uh, and I'm interested in preserving this site because it's so much more than just the lighthouse, right? We have 
uh, thousands of years of occupation, ranging from a Tequesta Middens at the site through uh, its historic buildings. Um, the site was also really important as part of the Saltwater uh, Railroad. So this was a way that freedom seekers traveled uh, south uh, and east to the Bahamas across the water. So people were trying to um, escape, you know, and find their freedom. And I think that aspect of the site is really interesting, right? And that's something we're, we're losing. Um, another aspect of the site is that you can really see the impacts of climate change at the site. Uh, so there is a U.S. Coast Guard survey marker that was placed there uh, in 1855. And when the survey marker was placed, um, it was placed on dry land, obviously. Uh, and when they relocated it in the 1980s, it was actually underwater um, out in the middle of Biscayne Bay, practically. So they have moved it um, back to dry land. But who knows how long uh, that area will be dry and above the water for. Built in 1825 and standing 100 feet tall, visitors can reach the top of the Cape Florida Lighthouse for a view of Biscayne Bay and Miami by climbing 109 steps. The Cape Florida Lighthouse and its surrounding areas within Bill Baggs State Park have a long and complex history. During Spanish Florida, this area was a refuge for self-liberated enslaved Africans and a launch point to reach freedom in the Bahamas. After the U.S. acquired Florida from Spain and began the Seminole War, the lighthouse was attacked and its light was extinguished between 1836 and 1846. It was fortified and rebuilt in 1847. While it was briefly recommissioned between 1978 and 1998, it was ultimately replaced by the offshore Fowey Rocks Lighthouse in 1878. The Cape Florida Lighthouse and its surrounding areas have already felt the effects of sea level rise, with historic preservationists working hard for decades to ensure it remains standing for future generations. I care about all historic sites and prehistoric sites, but in particular, the ones that I care about the most are the ones the, the ones that are called Tequesta sites, particularly in the Everglades and, and around downtown, that there has been attempts at protecting, um, not always successful, um, and the future of these sites, many of them right on the edge of the Miami River or right on Biscayne Bay. Dating back roughly 2,000 years, the Miami Circle was uncovered in 1998 by archaeologist Bob Carr. Before colonization by waves of European and American settlers, South Florida was stewarded by a number of indigenous groups, including the Tequesta. Like other cultures native to South Florida, Tequesta people were a complex, non-agricultural society who developed ceremonial architecture, were skilled artisans at carving wood and bone, and had wide-ranging trade networks, with some artifacts from the Miami Circle sourced from places as far away as modern-day Missouri and Georgia. The Miami Circle is thought to be the ceremonial complex of a larger Tequesta settlement spanning both sides of the river, and was the center of an intense preservation battle during its excavation. It is now a public park under the care of the Florida Division of Historic Resources. Archaeologists believe that Tequesta people, whose population was already dwindling at the time of European contact, were driven to Cuba by the Spanish. Seminole and Miccosukee people, as well as other survivors of Spanish occupation, continued to use the river for travel and trade into recent history. The site continues to hold a deep spiritual significance for many indigenous people throughout the Americas to this day. It's really difficult to kind of pick one site or pick a few sites to say, oh, we're most interested in preserving this one. All of our designated sites are significant in some way, otherwise they wouldn't be designated. Um, and you know, the county, we have so many significant historic, cultural, archeological and paleontological resources that date as far back as 10,000 years. So with that said, um, I will say that the Deering Estate is a really good example of a significant coastal site. Um, in our vulnerability assessments, it was ranked as the second most vulnerable historic site in the county. And um, what's particularly interesting about it is that it has very significant historic and archaeological resources within the same site. So understanding the political challenges of a sea level rise initiative, working with the Deering Estate to create a pilot project um, where we could really show people 
the plight on County Historic Resources would be a really valuable way to highlight the significance of these sites and their vulnerability in a changing climate. As a primary tourist attraction and one of the county's most exposed sites, the Deering Estate would really provide an excellent platform to develop some kind of sea level rise outreach program to an audience that's already receptive to the goals of historic preservation. And our office is actually currently working with the Deering State and with the University of Florida on a grant funded project to do exactly that. We're going to be doing 3D modeling of a portion of the estates and showing exactly what the site would look like as the sea levels continue to rise. The Deering Estate is an historic house, as well as a nature preserve, located in South Dade, Miami-Dade County. The stone house was built by industrialist Charles Deering in 1922. In addition to these resources, the Deering Estate's grounds include archaeological sites dating to the Seminole War, Florida's Spanish colonial era, the Jaquesta inhabitation of South Florida, and even older time periods. One of Miami's best-kept secrets, the Cutler Fossil Site, is also found on the grounds of the Deering Estate. The Cutler Fossil Site is a sinkhole with both paleontological remains from Florida's Ice Age as well as evidence of later human use as a hunting ground. Its human use dates to roughly 9,700 years ago, a time period known in Florida as the Late Archaic Era. The Ice Age animals found at the Cutler Fossil Site include the remains of an American lion, dire wolves, cave bears, and other megafauna. While many of its oldest sites are located on the Atlantic Coastal Ridge, an unusually high outcropping of limestone, the Deering Estate is nonetheless close to sea level, and most of its cultural resources are extremely vulnerable to the effects of climate change, hence its participation in Miami-Dade's pilot study. While not all of Florida's cultural resources can be saved in their entirety, archaeologists and preservationists are working hard to defend them from storm surge, record sites in detail, and preserve their stories. Because I'm at a university, I have had the fortune of um, being able to apply for grant money that has helped create the Coastal Heritage at Risk Task Force, or we, the acronym is CHART, which has brought together people from the Tribal Historic Preservation Office of the, the Seminole Tribe of Florida, um, members from the Miccosukee tribe, as well as academics from across different institutions, um, museums, county archaeologists, county preservation boards, as we try to assess what sites are most at risk. And more than, more than anything else, we want to tell the stories of some of these sites uh, before they go underwater. We're, we're trying to assess what sites will disappear and what sort of stories do these sites represent that people otherwise don't even know about as these sites disappear underwater? So here at the Florida Public Archaeology Network, one of the uh, things we try and do annually is actually visit a number of archaeological sites every year during the King Tides. Uh, and what we're hoping to achieve with that is to view what the archaeological site or the historic building might look like in the future as sea levels rise with climate change or what the site might look like with uh, significant, um, significant flooding during a major storm event. So when we go out to do these visits, uh, sometimes portions of the site can be totally inaccessible due to flooding. Um, sections of the site might be uh, underwater. Um, it makes it more difficult to do our work during a king tide uh, because of obviously the increased amount of water on the site. One of the major programs uh, that the Florida Public Archaeology Network has to address and raise awareness of climate change is our Heritage Monitoring Scouts program. So this was developed by Sarah Miller, who's the director of our Northeast and East Central offices. And it empowers people to document the impacts of climate change to archaeological sites, um, historic uh, buildings, historic cemeteries, really any, any of our heritage sites right, that are being impacted by climate change. Participating in that program is a great way for people to learn more about the day-to-day -day effects of climate change on specific sites um, near them. Our past has so much to do with our future, and we have so much we can learn from our past. 
there's so much more to understand about what came before as we look forward and we think about how do we deal with all of these environmental justice issues, these climate justice issues today as climate change encroaches on us. Things, whether they be an archaeological site, a historic building, or a historical cemetery, all of these things are preserved because people cared enough about them to reach out to legislators, to reach out to leaders in their community and say, this is something that is a critical part of my identity and it needs to be preserved for the future. When we think about climate change, uh, we think about it as something that's going to impact our future, maybe, and it's obviously impacting our present, but it's destroying evidence of our past as well. And we're losing the information about who we are and where we come from. It's very important for people to understand that historic preservation is not insular. And what I mean by that is, you know, historic preservation is an essential part of any field or any project that deals with the built environment. And, you know, we have to start to get away from thinking of historic preservation as, you know, trying to save a particularly beautiful building or a particularly beautiful site and start looking at historic preservation as how can we leverage the power of our historic cultural and archaeological sites in a way that creates better, more equitable, and more resilient communities for our residents.